He is a great poet in a land that loves writing and poetry. He won the Nobel Prize for Literature in 1995. Seamus Haney is from Northern Ireland. He is the first Irish Catholic to win the Nobel Prize. He has written 11 volumes of poetry, three books of criticism. He teaches at Oxford, did teach at Oxford, and still teaches at Harvard. He comes this hour for a conversation about his country, about his work, about his poetry, and about his friends in poetry. His works explore the conflicting experiences of his Irish heritage and speak to a human complexity that has no borders and no boundaries. His latest collection is called The Spirit Level, and it is due out in June, and I am very pleased to have him here at this table on this broadcast for this conversation. Welcome. Thank you. It's Thank nice you. to have you here. Nice to see you. Uh, the interesting thing about this extraordinary honor is that you were almost the last person to know. That is true, yes. <laughs> yeah. I was in Greece uh, for the first time. Uh, I was <clears throat> in a little fishing uh, port called Pylos on the southwest of the Peloponnese. I had spent uh, the day before uh, coming from Sparta yeah. over the mountains. Uh, we were uh, resting for a day. We had a very intense uh, time. We were in Athens, Mycenae, uh, and then Sparta, traveling with a Greek sculptor friend, Greek-American, Dimitri Hadzi, whom I know at Harvard, and his wife, Cynthia, Mari, and myself. It was a kind of uh, just ardent, wonderful time. We were hermetically sealed in, in, the, in the actual intensity of, of, the, of the sights in both senses, S-I-T-E-S. -E -S. <laughs> and we took this day of quiet. And um, after lunchtime on the Friday, I rang home because I knew my son Christopher would be around the house. So I rang about 3 o'clock, 4 o'clock in the afternoon. And he said to me, Dad, he said, I'm so proud. I said, what? <laughs> he said, uh, did you not hear? I said, no, what? <laughs> and he said... You have won the Nobel Prize. Well, I mean, I don't know what I felt. I called my wife and I said, you better tell your mother. <laughs> because some instinct told me that you don't say, I, I have just won the Nobel Prize. So it's okay to use that sentence if it's you or he. <laughs> but not For the first I. person singing or something. There's some deep law against that. <laughs> so anyway, Marie gets on the phone. That's right, yeah. yeah. And, uh, and what does she do? But she says, are you sure? <laughs> <laughs> and we call Stockholm. <laughs> no, that's true. Well, actually, this was the next thing. Then he yeah. said, you have to. Yeah. You oh, have call to call you. Stockholm. Oh, yes. yeah, because, uh, I mean, they want to know if you will accept it. Oh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like everything has its legal side. Yeah. yeah, well, we want to talk more about that. What's your life been like since then? Because forever now, it will be, it's almost like your name will not be just Seamus Heaney, but it'll also be Seamus Heaney, Nobel Laureate. How does it change you? Well, in it, it intensifies things that were there already. But uh, I don't think, it would, it, it would, I don't think I'm self-deceiving, uh, my, I'm not, I don't think I'm deceiving myself to say that uh, it hasn't, it hasn't, it changed in kind my life, you know? It has <clears throat> made the pressures that were there already more intense. In other words, mail and requests to read and requests to appear one way or another. Yes. That has to be dealt with. You're, before I was like a goalkeeper who had a ball shot at him every four minutes, <laughs> but now I'm like a goalkeeper. There's a rule. Every four seconds. Bionic <laughs> forwards sh shooting at you. So. Uh, and before also, because I've always worked in the university and because I've done a certain amount of, if you like, educational work of, of different sorts, community and school and so on, and been invited, I had to build a kind of shelter for myself within, within that. Mm -hmm. so, so, so I had prepared both physically and psychologically uh, shelters and they are desperately necessary now. Uh, In order to get back to writing. Yeah, yeah. You had watched your friend, Joseph Brodsky, who had handled it very well. Well, I admired uh, that in Joseph enormously. First of all, I admired the, uh, the, the unremitting uh, humility. Uh, to anyone who knows Joseph, it would be surprising to hear, to, hear, <laughs> to hear this word used about him. But he, <clears throat> he, had, he hadn't much 
respect for himself as a creature, you know, as a, as a citizen, you know. There was no question of, here I am, Joseph Brodsky, bow down before me, you know. But he had an enormous, he arrogated enormous rights to himself as a representative of, of intellect and poetry, you know. Mm. So his, his impatience and his overbearing was always uh, a, a kind of principled, you know. But he himself w went about without pomp or ceremony and uh, conducted himself after the Nobel Prize with the same kind of uh, smoking and moving along the corner of the street, you know. He, yeah. he, socially and, uh, and, every, and publicly, he remained uh, uh, a Democrat and, uh, and a free spirit. You know? And that energy was always the there until he got there. sick. Yeah. You know. well, of course, Joseph was had such sheer genius of yeah. you know, high voltage of, of energy, intellectual and, all, and other ways. We'll come back to this, but he and Derek Walcott were friends of yours. I, I don't know at what point, maybe at Harvard, that you came together or somewhere else. Well, I, I, I had read uh, I had read Derek Walcott long before I met him. I, I, I met Derek much later on in the yeah. late seventies. He also went through, uh, as the whole Caribbean did and does, uh, went through a, a cultural and political uh, development or crisis that was gone through in Ireland, eighteen nineties through to nineteen twenty or thirty. You know. When you, with, when you go towards independence from the colonial power, how then do you conduct yourselves? Do you retain the manners, as it were, of the conqueror of the colonial? Or do you in your, use your native resources as you see them? And there was actually, a, there, was, there was and probably still is in the Caribbean, that, that is acted out in terms of styles, you know? Mm -hmm. And in fact, in terms of poetry styles, Derek, uh, Derek retained his, as it were, debt and loyalty to English language and to the forms, the traditional forms of English, like sonnets and rhyme and uh, and uh, metrical uh, me metrical uh, traditions. You're about to celebrate what 57th birthday? 57. On April yes, 13th. That's right. That's right. Uh, Moss Bond? Moss Bond, that's right, yes, yeah. the little farm. Your father was a, a, a farmer and also a cattle trader. That's right. Dealer. He, they, we had a small farm, but his real love was uh, dealing, cattle dealing, going. We're talking about small communities. He, he would have traveled within a radius of about 13 miles. And. Um, he liked that. I now realize he liked being on the road, you know. Yeah. He wasn't, he, he, he owned the farm, he worked a bit on the farm, but we had somebody who, who actually did most of the he farm work. He liked being on the road because it gave him a chance to get away from... I don't know that. It wasn't so much a, a matter of, of avoiding anything. It was, I think he was, as they would say, empowered when he got that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> he carried the, uh, one of the tools of the cattle dealer straight is, of course, a, a, a stick, you know, an ice yeah. plant or a cane which has its uses uh, as a guiding and right, beating the cattle into line, so yeah. to speak. But it was also a little scepter, you know. It's, uh, yeah. So, so uh, it was he was good at it, and therefore. Empowering and ennobling. Yeah, and, uh, yeah. yeah. Didn't go to college. No. And your mom did no, not go to no, college? No, they, You were the first member of your family. Yes, I was the eldest uh, of nine. in the family. Of nine? Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah. But my, uh, my father's sister, Sarah, uh, she was a school teacher, and she had, she had gone to college in the 1920s. Uh, and uh, she had... Uh, it wasn't that... I wouldn't say that there was anything, uh, so to speak, illiterate about the family. There was a respect and a sense of the value uh, of, of books and so on, but there was just no, there was no, uh, no, no experience. Mm. How do you think being Catholic in Northern Ireland shaped you? Well, I think there are two parts to the question being Catholic and being Catholic in Northern Ireland. I think being Catholic, the longer I live, the more I realize the answer to that question is probably totally. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, in one way. Yeah. Because the world I grew up in was intensely religious. I mean, first of all, my mother was a woman of great faith, as I say, and great religious devotion. And the so the rituals of the household, 
you know, right through my, until I was a teenager, would include uh, night prayers, you know, the rosary and so on. The actual social uh, life of the week was based upon, I mean, church going was the outing. Yeah. Uh, the, the, whole, the whole sense of, uh, of what, what it was about was religious, you know. Uh, and when I went to college, of course, it was it was like a monastic regime. What was it? You were associated with Protestant kids, though. I mean, you saw them and, oh, and, yeah. and knew them. And there was this great thing that little that went. What was it, Billy? What, about King Billy from? Oh yeah, uh, well, they, uh, they, they had the depending on who said it. Yeah, <laughs> but I mean, I would make a distinction between, if you like, the the, the 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 totally the radiance of inner Catholicism as a child, yeah. and the and the sense of eternity and the sense of of uh, grace and God-filled space. That, that I'm, I'll speak of the sociological aspect in a minute, but the older I get, the more important I think that that inner expansiveness of consciousness and the actual supernatural sense of, of, a, of a universe drenched in, in radiance, you know? Yes. That, that's, that's absolutely central. Then there's being a Catholic in Northern Ireland, which has nothing to do with what I'm talking. It's to do with the social role. It's to do with being in a minority. To do with being in a minority and, looking and all that. Too, yeah. yeah, I mean, I, I could talk about this for <laughs> <laughs> half an hour. But um, uh, all that they say is true, of course, uh, both about the sense of difference and of the negotiating skills, I mean, between the groups, you know, Catholic, Protestant, that school, shouting abuse at each other. But that being part of the ritual, you know. Yeah. I was quite lucky in that I grew up in the country. It did, if I had to think, if I had grown up in, in Belfast, say, on the Falls Road, I'd have grown up in a Catholic ghetto with a sense of the other out there on the Shankill Road. And it would have been more herd-like. But I actually grew up face to face. I mean, the, my next door neighbor, or the family closest to us were, were the Evanses across the road. He was, so to speak, a Protestant. Uh, so he was both both a play, playmate and the other, you know. Yeah. And I, I mean, I often think that I always remember one Christmas morning, and this this to me over the years has become emblematic of the two traditions and so on. I went over to to him to see what he had got from Santa Claus, and he had got um, a little, uh, well, quite large in those days, a, a battleship yeah. uh, with uh, with little guns on it and everything. And it was a kind of Royal Navy, and it was total. It was a total loyalist, Protestant, Unionist, British, uh, masculine, imperial thing. And what had I got? I had been given a kaleidoscope. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, when, when well, I look back on it, say this is a totally Catholic gift, you know. So okay. inward wonder, but no real possession, you know. Yeah, right. And, and this, this was yeah. the, the battleship represented. Yeah, that was in, that was important. An extension of, of that's right of of control, control and, and patrol power. and yeah, yeah right. policing. Uh, but in that particular uh, countryside, and because my father was on the road, and a lot of the people he associated with were Protestants. I, part of me hates using this language you know, because it enforces kind of sectarian categories right, which you right. should be subverting. <laughs> yeah. well, let me, well, let me go to the politics of your yeah. friend John Hume was here. You've known him for a long time. Yes, I have, yeah. 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 Are you hopeful now? We had the ceasefire in 94, uh, then we had it violated um, in the last three months. Are you hopeful that about the politics? Well, I think we have moved from a situation where it was atrocious. I mean, atrocity was being committed constantly. We have moved from a situation of the atrocious to a situation of the messy. Yeah. And that seems to me to be a hopeful development. Messy is better than atrocious. Absolutely. And it is surely, I mean, there, there is some kind of false hope engendered that politicians will solve the world, you know? I mean, they, they can't. What, what they have to do is keep it keep the problem on the move. But I think it is conceivable that this ceasefire would be violated again, so to speak, the occasional bomb. But as long as we don't return, and I, I do not believe we will return, I'm hopeful to this extent, I do not believe that the IRA will mount a campaign again of the sort that was going on. Uh, because the consequences would be 
hellish, you know. You wrote a powerful poem, Casualty. Well, that was, that was about a, a man who was caught and blown up, blown up in a, an explosion in a pub because he was, he was in between every, all the pressures. I mean, um, I was very, very interested in him because, once again, uh, he was emblematic he was emblematic of uh, divisions and uh, questions. Uh, I couldn't have written about him except I knew him, and he was, uh, I was very, very fond of him. This man, this man, O'Neill, Lewis O'Neill was his name, uh, he, had, he had gone out on a night when there was a curfew on, and the curfew uh, w was called by the provisional IRA, said, don't go out, don't go out tonight, we are in mourning, for the 13 men that the British Army has shot in Derry. This was 1972. It, that was an atrocity committed by the British paratroopers. They did shoot these people in cold blood in Derry. So the whole Catholic community was outraged and in mourning and in solidarity. And this man actually did go out for a drink. To a Protestant pub. No, it wasn't a Protestant pub, actually. It wasn't. No, but it was a pub that was, a, a pub that pretended to be closed. Ah. Uh, but it was open at the, the back. Door, yeah. So uh, the, the bomb came there, as it were. And um, so he, you know, he, he had been punished for breaking ranks. At the same time, I mean, if you are James Joyce or Henry Gibson, uh, you break ranks, you know. This is the path, the path towards uh, freedom is a rank-breaking path, you know. So, so there are all those... Uh, Was there questions. some people who thought you broke ranks when you moved to Dublin in 72? I, I've heard this. <laughs> <laughs> but they weren't my ranks if they, if they thought that. Yeah, because you were... I don't know who... I mean, I'm, I, I'm not sure who would have, who would have felt that. Uh, I think maybe some Protestants, oddly enough, rather than yeah, Catholics. Really, because there was just some notion that by moving to Dublin you betrayed, the, the Catholics felt betrayed. Well, I, 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 I haven't, uh, I didn't uh, think that. You didn't that. hear that, Nora, and certainly. Did you feel any I always guilt? Was, well, a slight guilt, of course, yeah. Uh, but but uh, I would have been feeling guilt anyway. I mean, I'm very good at it, <laughs> whatever I am. <laughs> um, the move I made in 1972 from Belfast in the north of Ireland to, to Wicklow in the Irish Republic had, I know this clearly, nothing to do with the political situation. It had it, to do with? It had to do with an inner development, an inner necessity in myself as a writer, as a poet, to change my life, to go from a place with a job and so on. I was going freelance. I had made this decision. I was going to leave Belfast we were going to go, actually, we were looking at houses in County Derry and County Tyrone, that is in Northern Ireland. We were going to go from Belfast. Suddenly we were offered this cottage in Wicklow, and it was, we went to see it, it was a beautiful place, a kind of redemptive thing. So we followed that, but it was a, it was a following of an inner compass which had to do with my own imaginative and psychic needs. Not political, but then of course once, once I moved, what happened was, and I know when I was 33 at the time, uh, the Irish Times ran an editorial. You know, this, this was, what, 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 I'm, what I'm talking about was happening to me, an inner, an inner venture, a private uh, domestic move. And then, then it's written about in the paper, in an editorial page. So it becomes a public thing. And from that moment, as it were, being in Wakelow took on a different meaning. It took on political meaning. And, uh, uh, but it was, it, it was a move that had to be made. I mean, I, I, I don't, I generally don't know the answer to your question about, you would have to ask other people about feeling betrayed or not. Yeah. My notion would have been that they would have felt uh, uh, verified, you know, that somebody was leaving, leaving the ship saying, to hell with that, you know, yeah. <laughs> I don't know. It, poetry, uh, you once said it's about memory. Well, yes, I mean, I, I, I certainly in my own case, and in, and as far as I can see, in eighty or ninety percent of the cases, uh, poems come out of some previousness. Yeah, uh, that they, 
the energy for poems. It's, it's like a kind of psychic fossil fuel that's been there, and um, it comes up. Yeah. I think you've said there much is made of the metaphor that you have spoken to, at least, or people have written about, that for you, poetry is akin to digging, yeah. to gathering, mm -hmm. to... Mm -hmm. How do you see that? Well, that was, a, like, like all blessed poems, it was an accident that uh, I, I uh, connected uh, the pen with the spade, as yes, it were. Yes, exactly. Because uh, when I was a youngster going to school, most of the uh, wisdom was handed on to you in, in for, on proverbial form, you know. Right. And one of the things that uh, your elders would say to you, especially when they, they saw you going, going to school, was the pen's easy carried, you know. Yeah. And the pen's a lot lighter than the spade. Mm -hmm. So that's, and uh, I wrote a poem called Digging about, it was about a sociological shift, you know, from being the farmer's son in the field to being the uh, scholarship boy writing to being the, the poet for this first volume published and so on. But then I uh, went on to write poems about archaeological finds and so on. And I mean, I think this is uh, quite a natural image for, for what poetic activity is, because you are in negotiation with the unconscious, with uh, the dream part of yourself, with uh, the underlife of uh, the, the, the mind, with the cellar life. And uh, I, it, it's just a, a general and fairly uh, common uh, myth of what What does it begin is. with for you? A poem usually w would begin with uh, an image, a memory, or something seen that that uh, that immediately uh, has a has a radiance and an invitation to it. You know. Now, those once again those seen things quite often take on a radiance, take on an uncanny thing because they relate to something previous. You know. Uh, and I think everybody has these experiences where, for no reason at all. Uh, some some moment gets isolated, what Joyce would call an epiphany, you know, something like a tractor sitting in a field in Iowa. <laughs> I, I remember once drove past a, a field yeah. in Iowa in the snow and there was a, a solitary tractor in the field and I thought, you know, I haven't written about it, but it's that kind of thing precisely yeah. that would start off the poem. That would have ignited a poem. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's based on accident, uncanniness. And Does it require a certain arrogance to be a great poet? Well, I, I prefer to drop all adjectives from the poet there. <laughs> <laughs> the noun is itself a mighty one. Poet. Yeah. It's a it does, mighty It's a word. mighty noun. It is, yes. It's one of the few words that retains a sacred aura. It does. Uh, yeah. in, in even still. It does, yeah. And uh, it should be more scarcer <laughs> than it actually is. We should use it and, uh, for, for it, it, we too frequently say someone is a poet or some, well, or what we see as poetry when it's not, and it demeans the, well, I don't know. what I is think, poetry. I think, I think the, the noun poet, seriously, is still, still pe people, people intend good by it when, when they say it. You know, it's not used trivially, usually. Uh, it is, yes, in the sense, in the strict sense of arrogance, it is an arrogant act because you arrogate to yourself yes. a, 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 a word. And to go back to an earlier part of our conversation, that is, when I left Belfast and went full-time writing, I was, I, at that point, I uh, uh, arrogated to myself the word poet. And it happened in a very simple and, and uh, dramatic way. I brought our two children down to the school in Wicklow, which is in the Republic. And Irish is the official language of the, of the Republic. Yeah. And in some schools, they enter the details of the child in Irish. And the headmaster said, was writing down my uh, you know, address and so on. And then he, he, under the kind of said profession of father, he wrote down F-I-L-E, which is the word phila, yeah. which in Irish means poet. And usually I would have demurred, you know, said, oh, just put in professor or something. But I said, right. okay, no, full-time filler. And that, 
And I think there is a difference between writing poetry and conceiving of yourself or allowing others to conceive of you as a poet. There is, as I said, a land, you're a great poet in a land that loves great poetry. What is it about well, your I think, place? I think there are two, th two or three things. There, there, is, there is, over the last two or three hundred years, a language question, a change of language, a loss of the Irish language, a learning of English. Yeah. So, so that there is a repossession uh, and uh, a necessity to consolidate something, but both a common cultural memory and, uh, and, and an inner sense of psychic foundation, maybe. Uh, these are just guesses. There's that. There's the, there's the political unfinishedness of the Irish situation. In one way, Ireland is settled. There is a republic, uh, independent, and there is a British section linked over there. But, of course, all the evidence is that it is unsettled. So that when you have, and, and that means that in some deep part of everybody's being, uh, there is an unsettled, unfinished bit. And there is a neediness for uh, in wholeness and integrity. And the poet provides that? The writer provides that? The wholeness, well, the sense of? Yes, there is. I think that's what, that's what it does provide. Uh, it, is the, it's not an illusion of wholeness. It's actually a glimpsed moment of wholeness or an intuited wholeness. That's what, I think that's what artistic form, poetic form, poetic uh, achievement is. It's a, a, a feeling that something has been consolidated uh, for that moment, you know? And uh, so you could have a post-colonial theory of Irish poetry, or you, you could have uh, a kind of linguistic theory of it, or you could have uh, a notion that good writers or great writers like Yeats and Joyce uh, call forth uh, more, you know, that, that it's habit-forming uh, as, as, a, as a way of life. You know? There is a greater, I suspect, a sense of appreciation, certainly of the poet, that noun, mm. than we have here. I, I, I think that is true. I, I hesitate once again to exaggerate it, but I do think it is true, actually, that the uh, position, that the word, the, the poet has some public function. I, I don't mean that they have, the poet has to appear in public, yeah. but in the Irish Times, say, if a poem by Nolan Egonel or myself or Derek Mahan or whoever appears on a Saturday, I mean, the Prime Minister will probably read it, you know, the President, Mary Robinson, will read it, the Bishop, of, <laughs> the Protestant Bishop, the Catholic Bishop of Dublin will read it, uh, your, your friends will read it. So, so that it is, it's part of the, the language and it's part of the possessions and the name of the poet is part of the cultural uh, possessions of the tribe still, you know. So, so there is... There is actually a, a real truth to it, and then there is a kind of chic truth to it also, that, yeah, you know, yeah, etc. Yeah. But I, I think that that, that that is not true in the States for, for a poet. You know, it's very, very difficult for any poet to, but it's partly because of the size of the country, so, but it's very difficult for any poet to be, to be possessed, you know, by, by the world around, around him or her. How do you see your, or do you see you have a role and more and more I, I see my role is to write the best poems possible. I would have thought that was an evasive answer 10 or 12 years ago. Yeah, I would, I would think it is too, but it's, no, it's not, not now. Why? No, it's not. Why is it, why is because, it a, a because, new role to do? Go ahead. Because uh, I have actually professed poetry, if you like. I mean, I have, uh, I have been a teacher. I have done, and I believe in these things. I believe in... Uh, standing up and giving lectures on poetry to undergraduates. And I, I believed in doing the Oxford professorship because, uh, because partly I had a certain, a certain gift for doing it, yes. separate from writing poetry entirely. For teaching it, for, yeah. for... It's separate from writing. Explaining it. Yeah, it's separate from writing it. But the older I get, uh, I say, well, now you've done your duty, you have done well by the art. You've paid... For, you paid your dues paid to your, your dues, craft. Exactly, but also paid dues to, to society. You've gone into schools. Okay. You, have, you have also 
you know, going to the fundraiser for the good cause and so on. Stop it, you know. You also, you look back, I, I went through my study with a, a friend who was a kind of bibliographer man. I spent two months, two years ago, going through papers over the years. The number of two or three page things as I had done for openings of exhibitions, you know, uh, the number of introductions, the number of letters written to people, uh, all of it part of, part of the, as I see it, the covenant you have with, first of all, the covenant with the unpublished. That's one thing that poets have, I think. Uh, the, the, it's up to poets to look after the next generation of poets. I, I do believe that they should be doing the selection, you know. And, and, and poets you should be selecting by well, some process listening. the next generation yeah, of poets? Yeah, they should be listening. You know, they should, listening. Yeah, yeah. They, inevitably they do. And ratifying, in a sense? Co correct. Absolutely. Uh, but see, I don't, let me just go back one second, yeah. because I, I at least had some impression that something like that happened to you at some point. You became ratified. You yeah. became, yeah. You, you, you went into the mystery of the realm. Yeah. Am first, I right? That's right, yeah. First, I mean, the first thing is ra the sense of excitement in yourself when you write. Yeah. But the second thing, I mean, that comes, if, if you're lucky enough, something will happen and you say, I think I've done it, you know? Yeah. Then you want to know, you want some ratification. I mean, usually that takes the form of sending it out and having it published, which is, let us not forget, a magical moment from the unpublished to the published condition. I mean, that is ratification. Then, if you're lucky, a book maybe. And then you become a textual creature with the same name as yourself. You know? mm. uh, then, if you're lucky again, and I have considered myself to be blessed with luck, you meet poets you really admire, who seem to think you're okay. Yeah. And uh, th this happened to me with, with Irish poets and uh, and uh, Ted Hughes, for example. Uh, and you were saying that that's the responsibility of people like you. Well, them. well, it's not a written down. It's not a written thing. But I do feel. I do feel that that's what, yes it does. But I also think that at the age of 57, you've stopped hearing what's happening to the 17 year olds, you know? Yeah. And also you have paid your dues. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know. What's it about writing the best poetry you can? What's that about? Well, it's about redemption, <laughs> <laughs> really. Redemption. Yeah, uh, that, it used to be called making your soul. I think for, for someone who is a writer, that the sense of self-justification, the, se the sense of having made your soul, the sense of having uh, made sense or made something of it, is dependent upon the mysterious uh, verification that comes with the sounds and words being put in the right order. There is a sense of you have advanced yourself a bit to arrive at where you were already. I mean, it's a very curious experience, the writing of a poem, or indeed the reading of, the reading, an exciting reading, which is, gives, carries, you, carries you out with a sense of yes, 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 but you arrive at a place somehow that you foreknew, you know. Yeah. And uh, I think it is to do with wholeness and uh, a sense that all that is possible has nearly got done. You know? Do you think at age 57, approaching 57, mm. do you think about different things now? Is the subject matter for you changing? I don't know that the subject matter is changing. I think that the perspective or the... But Joseph Brodsky had this phrase which came from Frost, the plane of regard. He was very fond the of The plane of regard. The plane yeah. of regard changes a bit, you know, but but the actual kick-starting thing, the things that move you, the things that, uh, that you're temperamentally animated by or attracted to, those don't change that much. I mean, they can't afford to change that much. It's your sense of the world uh, may widen or whatever, but as a writer, it's, uh, it's, it's your nervous system, your temperament, your... You know. I'm in conversation with you. I'm reluctant to exaggerate because you'll <laughs> slap me. Uh, it is the. I think, someone said of Winston Churchill that he mobilized the language and saved a nation. I think John F. Kennedy said that in World War II. Have, 
Have you used your gifts as best they could be used? Yes, I think so. I mean, I don't. I mean, uh, I uh, I'm not a political leader. I know you're not. I didn't have to mobilize anybody. Yeah. But just to, I had to move truly. <laughs> uh, I've. you the best you can do is to try to be a true to what your inner sixth sense, your questors and sensors are telling you. That's the way. I think the older you get, maybe the less certain you are what 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 your quest or sensors are telling you. The more you know and the more experience you have, yeah. the less sure you the are less about sure the you are. sensors. The less sure you are, yeah. The less sure you are about your own about the rightness of your of your doing. Because you've seen more, yeah, you've and tasted you realize, more. And in the beginning you're obsessed with your own sense of what what I mean, your instincts and your your entitlement to do this, you know, I will, you know, your righteousness. But the older you get, you, you realize that the, the, quite often there are implications for other people. You know, take being a parent, you know. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you, it's very rare to meet somebody who has children as I now have 30, 28, and 22, who thinks, well, I did that very well. <laughs> <laughs> you you know, rarely meet anyone. <laughs> no mistakes there. <laughs> <laughs> no one says that. No. Yeah. It's impossible to do that right in one way, you yeah. know. So because there's no formula, but I mean, there's no yeah, but yeah, there's I mean, no I, perfect way. Yeah, I mean that many things if you had your life to live again you would do them differently, of course. But but you 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 try not to deceive, I suppose, and you try to uh be as true as possible. What would you do differently? I'm not telling you. <laughs> you see, but but are there were there crossroads and steps and, well, I, I and don't moments think, in which you uh, I was I think I think the crossroads would, would probably be the same. Yeah. Tell you the truth. So I mean, the, the road not taken. So to speak. no, no. Uh, maybe just one one little career choice, but that's that's not. Uh, in the great scheme of things, it's and not. And neither here nor there, so to speak. No. Yeah. yeah. It's wonderful to have you here. Uh, I want you to read something, if you will. This is from, um, you picked up the spirit level, um, and it is Mint. Yeah, it's a poem called Mint. Tell me about it before, if, if whatever is it's appropriate. It's uh, a memory of okay. Mint grew at the back of the house. It's autobiographical in one way. But I think mint uh, is belongs to the species as much as to an autobiography. The smell of mint is, yeah. you feel it belongs to us when we were pretty stooped and close to the ground. I like this poem because it went farther than just my own uh, memories that opened, opened up. Um, I think I know it by heart, but just in case. Okay. I would do the same. Mint. It looked like a clump of small, dusty nettles growing wild at the gable of the house, beyond where we dumped our refuse and old bottles, unverdant ever, almost beneath notice. But to be fair, it also spelled promise and newness in the backyard of our life, as if something callow yet tenacious sauntered in green alleys and grew rife. The snip of scissor blades, the light of Sunday mornings when the mint was cut and loved. My last things will be first things slipping from me. Yet let all things go free that have survived. Let the smells of mint go heady and defenseless, like inmates liberated in that yard. Like the disregarded ones we turned against, because we'd failed them by our disregard. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Um, Seamus Heaney, Nobel Prize for Literature 1995. Um, my thanks to uh, John Scanlon and Pete Hamill, who uh, friends of yours who helped me understand and appreciate um, you and your work. I thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Pleasure.